Okay, hi everyone. This is going to be the PowerPoint lecture for chapter two. We're gonna build upon uh, chapter one here, looking at uh, ways to assign costs. So as an overview, right, as a kind of beginning refreshing uh, remark here, I have companies generally capitalize cost inventory on the balance sheet. Then upon selling the product, uh, they will recognize the expense as cost of goods sold on the income statement, right? So traditionally, you know, you've seen this in financial accounting, uh, capitalize in inventory, capitalize, capitalize. Then when you sell it, expense, cost of goods sold on the income statement. Now, uh, as I have here, thus many companies use a form of absorption costing for product costing. Um, under absorption costing, basically your manufacturing costs, both your fixed and variable manufacturing costs, you're going to assign those to units of products. And uh, as I have here, that is units or your inventory, right? They are said to absorb the manufacturing costs. So the idea with this, right, if you're producing a product, right, uh, and you capitalize it, you put it on the balance sheet, right, what's going on here are those costs associated with manufacturing it, they're being absorbed into inventory. It's kind of like a sponge absorbs water, right? Uh, inventory absorbs those costs. Now, in distinction, right, non-manufacturing costs, these are going to be period costs, right? You'll expense these as they incur. Talked about this last chapter. Uh, you can refer back to, if you want to see this, uh, at the traditional income statement. So when you assign costs, right, we talk about uh, we're assigning it for absorption costing purposes. Um, one way you can do this, right, is through something called job order costing. And there's different techniques we'll look at. You know, there's uh, we'll look later at like process costing, but the first one we're starting with uh, is job order costing. And this is really an appropriate technique for assigning costs uh, when there's kind of different or unique products that are produced. And uh, it doesn't just have to be products, right? It could be services as well. So for products, right, I have like gene styles, if you're doing a construction product or something services, right? You have like hospitals or uh, law, legal accounting firms, movie studios, right? The idea is, hey, we're producing a movie. We need to uh, track the cost of this job, this movie, right? What is it costing us? And one of the things you do with this, right, is um, as I have here, you take the cost that you trace to the job, um, you divide it by the units that are produced, uh, and then you can figure out an average cost per unit or your unit product cost. We'll see this. So, like I said, accounting is really learned through doing. I think these PowerPoint lectures are helpful because it you know, gives the material a little bit of flavor. I could give some background information with it. Uh, but really, we learn this through doing it with like the examples in here, the in-class problems. And then uh, those like homework problems and the optional problems. So really, like I said, a lot of the learning in this class happens outside of class. Uh, you know, class is important, right? Uh, but for everything to click and kind of have it all come together, you got to put in that time, uh, the reps, the study. In any event, right? Let's assume we're a fabricating company and in a fabricating company, we can just like fabricate or make stuff, right? Like out of metal and hey, you want a shape or something, maybe we can fabricate it. Um, you know, say a theme park, let's just say Kennywood, right? Uh, Kennywood is an amusement park in Pittsburgh. Um, let's say they come to us and they're like, hey, uh, we're making a new roller coaster, right? Uh, the Steel Phantom 3000 or something, right? It'll be the fastest roller coaster in the year. And then, you know, six months later, there'll be a faster roller coaster, uh, the fastest one in the world. In any event, right, they come to us and they say, hey, we need two roller coaster connectors. In other words, those little things that connect the carts almost look like a steel um, a cable chain or something, right? So just imagine they say, hey, we need two of them, right, for our new roller coaster. 
Now us, right, if we're the manufacturer, the fabricator in this case, uh, and we, we, this would be like our job, right? This would be like a job uh, that we want to track the cost for. And we said, right, when we're tracking costs uh, for manufacturing products, we have uh, our direct materials, our direct labor, and our manufacturing overhead. Now, uh, with this, right, we would start with our direct materials and we would say, hey, in order to produce these two roller coaster connectors, each connector is going to need one of part A and two of part B. In other words, these are like parts we have uh, at our manufacturing facility. So in other words, if each one needs one of part A and we're making two of them, we're going to need two of part A. And if each connector needs two of part B, and we're making two connectors, we're going to need four of part B. And you know, we can see what they cost us right there, 496 and 103. So part A, we're going to begin to do it for 992. Part B, 412. We can see then that our total direct material cost is 1404. Okay? It's like one third done. It was like pretty easy, right? <laughs> Where this gets complicated is later on. Um, so what we would do is we would go in our production department, they would prepare a materials requisition form, basically a form that says, hey, other department, milling department, we need these materials. And afterward as well, right, once production um, you know, begins or well, we're starting this project, uh, we would create something called a job cost sheet. In other words, hey, what does this job making these two units, these roller coaster connectors, what does this cost us? And it's basically a sheet that's going to track our direct materials, our direct labor, and our manufacturing overhead. So uh, we talked about our direct materials, talked a little bit about the associated forms we would use. The next thing we'd have to look at is our direct labor. Right? And remember we said that our direct labor uh, is like literally the direct labor, like the people who are directly working with the product. It's like the guy who's like mixing the dough and stuff, putting the cheese on the pizza, they're directly working with it. If it's not direct labor, right, then it would be indirect labor uh, that we would attribute to uh, and account for uh, in manufacturing overhead. In any event, right, for direct labor, what we would do is we would have time tickets. We could see, hey, how much are our workers who are directly working on this product, uh, what amount of time do they put in on it? So let's just say here that the time tickets indicated that there were 10 direct labor hours. It was uh, 4460 per hour. So hey, our total direct labor for this job is 446. Okay, so we know our direct materials. We know our direct labor. Third, we have to figure out our manufacturing overhead, right? Um, and this is where it gets a little bit complicated with job order costing. So we know manufacturing overhead, you could divide that between like, you know, what manufacturing overhead is variable versus what uh, portion of it is fixed. The total amount of those two are gonna be our total manufacturing overhead, but some of it's variable, right? In other words, like, um, as they have for cost varies in proportion of production, right? If we use a little bit of glue or something in this, uh, the total cost of glue is gonna be a function of how much product we make, right? It, it can vary, right? But our fixed manufacturing overhead, this is like fixed regardless of how much product we make. So right, our insurance on our building, that's gonna be a flat 500 bucks, whether we make you know, two units or we make a thousand units, right? It's fixed. So as I have here, right, we need to use an allocation base to assign overhead costs to production. And I have this is achieved by, a term, by determining a base common to our products and services. So we have to look at all of our products, all of our services, and find uh, an appropriate allocation base. And you know, traditionally what you would use here as I have an allocation base is a measure. Usually you'd use things like direct labor hours or machine hours. Um, as part of a predetermined overhead rate to assign overhead costs to products or services. So we'll see this, right? The idea with manufacturing overhead here is uh, we're going to figure out a predetermined overhead rate 
that we assign. So uh, as I have and as we indicated, we must factor our allocation base into our predetermined overhead rate. And we can see this with various examples. Uh, it really depends on what your allocation base is, right? Are you using labor hours, machine hours? But what you're going to do here, right, with your predetermined overhead rate, which we'll see, first off, let's just look at the equation because there's going to be like, problems on this uh, in the homework, and then there will be optional questions. We will probably look at this as well in the uh, in-class problem. So to figure out your predetermined overhead rate, just looking at the equation itself, and we'll explain it, you're going to have it equal your total estimated manufacturing overhead, right? That's going to be your fixed portion plus, um, in this case, uh, your estimated, per, estimated manufacturing overhead per unit of allocation base times the uh, est total estimated allocation base, all divided by the total estimated allocation base. For the time being, you know, just look at that, you know, take a mental snapshot of it. We will see how this works. So as I have here, right, we determine this rate, our predetermined overhead rate, at the beginning of the period by use of estimates. In other words, we use estimates with an allocation base, an appropriate allocation base, um, and then we apply it throughout the, the period, uh, the predetermined overhead rate. In other words, to, like step one is determine our overhead rate at the beginning of the period based on estimates. And then step two is during the period, as we incur the allocation base, right? So say that we said direct labor hours uh, was, was the appropriate allocation base to assign our manufacturing overhead. As we incurred those, we would multiply it times our predetermined overhead rate uh, to apply uh, and determine our, uh, manufact our applied manufacturing overhead. So, for example, right, if we determined our predetermined overhead rate, kind of going right here, right, if we did this formula and we said, uh, hey, it's $20 per direct labor hour. So it looks like our allocation base with direct labor hour, we use that to figure out $20 per direct labor hour. We'll look at problems later on that plug in those numbers. Um, and then during the period, we incur five hours of direct labor hours. We would then assign $100 of manufacturing overhead to the job. In other words, we would do right the 20 per direct labor hour times the five hours, okay? Continuing here. So if we're going back to uh, our roller coaster example, right? We talked about um, our direct materials. We talked about our direct labor. Now we're going to figure out uh, our manufacturing overhead. So here in this example, uh, we're going to say it was $540. But hey, that's like at the end of the rainbow, right? How did we get there? How did we determine this? So the first thing we had to do here was we had to uh, you know, estimate our total manufacturing hours. In other words, how long do we think uh, what our total manufacturing hours are gonna be, right? So we're gonna say 40,000. Um, then we're gonna estimate our total fixed manufacturing overhead, right? We're gonna say that was 640. And then we're gonna estimate our total variable manufacturing overhead and we'll just say, hey, it was $4 per direct labor hour. So I tried to color code these um, with it. So what we would then do is, right, step, uh, you know, step four here in the sense that we're starting, we've done direct materials, direct labor, right? Um, but really for purposes of establishing the predetermined overhead rate, we would plug this information in over here. Uh, our estimated fixed, plus you know, our $4 per hour estimated variable times uh, the estimated direct labor hours, all over 40,000. In other words, we would say, hey, how we're going to apply this here, our predetermined overhead rate, is gonna be $20 per direct labor hour, okay? And let's say um, during the period, right, we had uh, 27 
direct labor hours. So in this case, right, if we did 20 times 27, uh, our manufacturing overhead that we're going to apply for these jobs is $540. Continuing here, right, so if we were to go to the roller coaster example uh, and just summarize everything here, right, we have our total direct materials of 1404. You can go back and get that right from here, right? 1404, one part of that, two parts of that, the costs, add them together. Okay. Total direct labor hours, or I'm sorry, total direct labor of 446. Right, we get that right from here, from those time tickets. There we go. And then our total manufacturing overhead is gonna be 540, right? So in that case, how did we get it? Well, what we did is, if we go back here, right, uh, what we had to do is identify an appropriate allocation base. We said it was direct labor hours. Then what we did is we populated here the information to figure out our predetermined overhead rate. In other words, uh, at the beginning of the period, we used estimates, um, and as we uh, you know, used those, uh, we figured out our predetermined over rate, overhead rate. During the period, as we incurred the allocation base, we multiplied it over. So in this case, right, we plugged in the information here to figure out the predetermined overhead rate, and then multiplied that times actual uh, allocation base incurred. So with that, right, we're going to have 2390 of total product costs, you know, those three added together. Um, and if that's the total cost and we're making two units, then the uh, unit product cost uh, is going to be 1195. So that ties back, let me find the slide here, right to here, right, where we talked about unit product costs. We basically figure out the total costs. We divide it by the number of units, in this case two we made, um, to say that, hey, per unit our product cost was $11.95. And um, one thing we do have to remember here, right, is that uh, for purposes of the manufacturing overhead, that was based on estimates. So uh, it's not the actual cost of the product right now, it's, it's based on estimates. We'll true things up at a later point in time, um, but this kind of goes into the idea here, why wouldn't you just use the actual rate? Uh, well, there's like a variety of things. First off, it could be hard uh, you know, to track this throughout uh, the period, um, and you know, there might be like specific instances we couldn't uh, identify or find but another issue is, as I have here, it revolves around seasonal fluctuations in costs. So as I have, uh, for example, heating or cooling, that could be higher during one time of year versus another time of year, okay? Um, so your utilities could be different. So uh, two identical jobs, right, completed at different times, they could have totally different costs, right? If you're just doing it by actual costs, um, and you made something during the winter when your heating bill was really high, then your manufacturing overhead is going to be bigger, which means that your cost of your product is going to be bigger. Versus if you made it in the summer where you didn't need that, um, you know, the heating and stuff. So that's one reason why we based it off estimates. So as I have here to avoid this confusion, we're going to use that predetermined overhead rate based on estimated costs. At the end of the year, however, we do calculate our actual overhead costs for record keeping purposes. So with job order costing, as I have here, right, managers use job cost information to establish plans and make decisions. So for example, which product should we sell, right? In other words, if this thing costs us you know, $50 to make, is it worth selling? Likewise, um, it, once we you know, figure out the cost, it also could help us determine what we should charge for a product, right? So uh, imagine you're making a product without any information, right? And I come up to you and I say, hey, uh, we're producing watches, right? 
and we have a you know a watch line we just made. What should we charge for it? Well, in a vacuum, that would be hard for you to tell, right? Is this like a Timex where it might be like 20 or 30 bucks? Or is this more like a Rolex where it could be $10,000? So uh, job order cost thing would be a good item there because we could look at what the job costs and that would help us, hey, it's, it's more like a Timex, right? Maybe we should charge you know, 50 bucks for this, 40 bucks um, with it. So one thing uh, with that, like a technique they use is this thing called cost plus pricing. So uh, basically they build a markup. In other words, anything we sell, we're gonna uh, you know, sell it at 50% of, you know, on top of its cost. So uh, say something cost us a uh, hundred bucks, right? Uh, a watch costs us a hundred bucks to make per watch. When we figure out our pricing, we're just gonna use a cost plus pricing technique where there'll be a 50% markup of cost. So it's cost, plus 50%, that's what we're gonna sell it for. 100 plus 50% of 100 is 150. Continuing here. So it says direct materials and direct labor, they're relatively easy to trace, right, because they're a direct cost. Look, we can see that, um, you know, when we made this roller coaster unit that we need you know, these parts. Right, it's very clearly there. Likewise, the people who are directly working on it, uh, hey, we can see that uh, you know they're directly there working. We have the timestamps. It's like very clearly and directly traceable. Manufacturing overhead, right? We said which is an indirect cost, kind of a composition of it. That can be hard to trace, right? And if we fail to accurately trace it, we can really distort the job cost. Um, so what this means is, right, when we go back to kind of that manufacturing overhead with the predetermined overhead rate based on the allocation base, we really need to make sure that uh, when we allocate our manufacturing overhead that we're using the best base that we can. So in other words, uh, you know, a good example here. So for example, let's say uh, you and three friends order a pizza with 10 slices. Uh, you eat one slice of pizza and your friend eats five slices of pizza. So this guy must be pretty hungry, right? And your friend who had the five pieces, at the end of the, uh, the meal, the check comes and let's just say it was like $20 for the pizza. Um, and you know, you have five people there, so uh, each person would pay $4 or something, right? Um, that's what your friend would suggest to you, right? We have five people or I'm sorry, we have four people, uh, so we each should throw in five bucks, right? But you're kind of looking at your friend and you're saying, I had one slice and you had five, right? It may not be the best uh, allocation base here, the number of people, a better allocation base uh, would probably be a you know, number of slices eaten, right? That would probably more accurately you know, trace the cost of it. In the same way, Right when we're looking at manufacturing overhead and looking at um, you know the allocation base there, we got to make sure we're picking the right one because if we aren't, it could be distorted. It could be like the guy who eats five slices and says, "Let's base it off the number of people here, not how many slices." So what you really like is a best practice, right? Um, is you're going to want to select an allocation base that has a clear cost driver. Right where it's like very clear, um, you know what the, uh, you know, the what is driving the cost in this case. And a cost driver uh, is really it's a factor, so it can be like machine hours, beds that are occupied, computer time that causes overhead costs. Right. So in our uh, example, and what many companies do is they'll select a single cost driver. So like in the roller coaster one, we use direct labor hours. We said, hey, that would be uh, a good way to allocate manufacturing overhead, okay? Um, now, that was just like a simple example to like get our feet wet and learn this stuff. In practice, a company uh, can, and they likely do, uh, use multiple cost drivers. So 
if we have multiple cost drivers, then we're going to have multiple predetermined overhead rates. It's just like the example we did, uh, but a little bit more detailed. So as I have here, for example, uh, if you examine a company by production departments, if one department is really labor intensive and they're looking to assign manufacturing overhead, they would really and probably should be using direct labor hours as the cost driver. If, however, another department, they're more machine intensive, right? A better uh, you know, cost driver for them would be uh, machine hours. You could sum those two departments together to figure out your um, manufacturing overhead, your, your, your applied manufacturing overhead. Versus in distinction, you know, using one cost driver direct labor hours for both departments. That would be a little bit distorted. So we have to kind of keep things separate based off of uh, the best cost driver we can find in light of the facts and circumstances. So as I have here, right, let's look at another example. Suppose we have two production departments, right? We have a milling department and they're gonna use machine hours as the cost driver. And then we have an assembly department that's gonna use direct labor hours as a cost driver. And at the beginning of the year, we have the following estimates, right? Because remember we said we determine our predetermined overhead rate at the beginning of the year based on estimates. Okay, so for the milling department in the assembly, it looks like we have machine hours, direct labor hours, our total fixed manufacturing overhead cost, uh, our variable manufacturing overhead cost per machine hour, and then our variable manufacturing overhead per direct labor hour, okay? And let's say here in this setup and that during the current month, we started job 407, okay? And the company that came up and they say, hey, you know, internal manager, managerial accounting, right? Uh, what is our cost? For this job 07, right? We need to track the cost for it. So accordingly, based off what we learned, right, we're going to need to use and figure out our predetermined overhead rate. And we're, we're going to use the cost drivers from the uh, last slide, right? Um, if we go back here, right, we have our machine hours and our direct labor hours, right? And we're going to apply it to our allocation base uh, using the below information. So in other words, um, you know, here's you know, some information, here's the estimates, here's what's happening, right? Our machine hours were 90, 4, 5, 20, direct materials were 800, 370, 70, and 280. So this is where it gets a little bit more complicated because there's multiple cost drivers. As I have here, right, like the first example where we used a single cost driver, when there are multiple cost drivers, there's a multi-step process. So we have step one, where we're gonna determine our estimated total manufacturing overhead, that is to say our fixed manufacturing overhead and our variable manufacturing overhead for each department. Step two, we're going to calculate the predetermined overhead rate for each department. Step three, we're going to take those predetermined overhead rates and multiply them times the allocation base that was incurred for each department. Determine the total job cost in step four, basically add both departments together. And then step five, we can figure out our sales price uh, and it looks like we're going to continue to use that cost plus pricing technique. Okay, so we can look at this here, right? Here's a little bit more detailed example of it. So step one says to determine estimated total manufacturing overhead for each department. Okay, so let's go up here and look at step one. Um, so in our milling department, uh, our total manufacturing overhead, it's going to be a function, if we go back here, right, oh, I'm sorry, I got to zoom out, uh, it looks like the fixed manufacturing overhead was 390, right, they have the fixed portion, 
Then they have the $2 per machine hour right here, the variable per machine hour. And then it looks like, um, oh, sorry, we have, uh, let's see here which department we're in, uh, 60,000 machine hours. So we get that from, one second here, I'm flipping between too many slides, too many, too quick here. Okay, here we go, 60,000. Okay, we're staying in the milling department, okay? So basically what we're doing here, right, is we're gonna take our fixed portion plus our variable per portion per unit times like the actual units in, or I'm sorry, times the units here, 60,000. Uh, that's gonna give us 510, right? And we'll just focus on one of these, right? What you do is basically you repeat it for the other using the other things and then you add them together. So what we did here is we just figured out our total manufacturing overhead for the milling department. We said it was 510, the 390 plus the $2 per machine hour times the 60,000, okay? Carry that down here. Step two is, you know, these numbers up here are based on uh, estimates. Now we need to figure out our predetermined overhead rate. So we're gonna use uh, that equation that we looked at before. So we're gonna take our 510 here, right? Our total uh, manufacturing overhead divided by the 60,000 machine hours gives us 850 per machine hour, okay? And then what we do is uh, we're going to look at uh, applying that overhead, that predetermined overhead rate to job 407. So it looks like there were 90 machine hours, right? So this is like actual over here. These are estimates, so estimate, actual, okay? Uh, so that's gonna give us 765, okay? So what we did here, this is just like the roller coaster example when we did um, like just the manufacturing overhead for that portion of it. It's like we just did it again here, right? Figure out the predetermined overhead rate, multiply it times the actual, there you go. You would then do the same thing for the assembly department, right? You have your fixed estimate plus your variable, uh, or yeah, plus your variable times your estimated total amount. That's gonna get you 800,000 down here. Use that amount to figure out uh, your predetermined overhead rate for the assembly department. Multiply that times the actual amount, 20 direct labor hours right here in the assembly department, that's gonna get you 200, okay? So we're kind of at the same landing spot here. We have 765 and 200. And then what we would do is just look at our direct materials for each, our direct labor for each, which are you know pretty easy to trace. And then just add them across, right? Our total direct materials are you know, from our milling plus our assembly. Our direct labor are from our milling plus assembly. And then uh, our manufacturing overhead applied, the 965 comes from the milling and assembly, right? You can see I try to you know, label this yellow, follow it down, 850, follow it down. Gives you a little bit of a you know, better way to eyeball it. Sometimes this can be like confusing. Uh, if you look at those like optional problems, they tend to give a lot of information. Um, so I, I, I like to keep things a little bit simpler, uh, you know, with using like round numbers and whole numbers, but uh, in any event, right, if we were to then look at our total cost of the job, it would be 2485. In other words, it would be our total direct materials, our total direct labor, and then our total manufacturing overhead applied. Add them all together, 2485. And then what you would say is, right, uh, the total cost of the job, you know, would be that 2485. If you, uh, you know, wanted to figure out what you should charge for it, uh, the markup, it looks like they'll use a, you know, a cost uh, plus here, and maybe they're saying it's 75% instead of 50%, right? So, hey, uh, we want to do cost plus 75% 
of cost. So in this case, right, you take the 2485 times 75%, you get the 1863, right? So if you want to figure out what you sell it for, it's going to be your cost, 2485, plus 75% of your cost on top of it, 1863. Add those together, you're going to sell this thing for 4348. Right? That's the idea with it, with this cost plus pricing. Let me zoom out a little bit here. So uh, as we've indicated, right, manufacturing overhead, uh, this is determined using a predetermined overhead rate, which is based on estimates. In this framework, estimated manufacturing overhead in a period will uh, very likely be different from actual manufacturing overhead. At the end of the day, right, if ultimately our estimated is less than our actual manufacturing overhead, we're going to be underapplied. Conversely, right, if ultimately at the end of the day our estimated manufacturing overhead is greater than our actual manufacturing overhead, then we would be overapplied. Um, Regardless, you need to adjust the cost of goods sold on the financial statements to correct the balance uh, in cost of goods for whether this is under or over applied. Uh, you know, we'll see this in examples or in the optional problems, uh, but for the time being, like I said, this is more like high level. One example, go, go through things, kind of paint the outline of the picture. Uh, and then I have here, right, it says recall a job cost sheet. This tracks our assigned direct materials, our direct labor, and our manufacturing overhead. Um, and then as I have here, when this is viewed collectively, right, uh, our job cost sheets, uh, they're going to be a subsidiary ledger. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this information to determine, uh, hey, what part of our jobs, what's that, uh, what amount of that is going to be our WIP? right, our work in progress, what amount of them are done, right, they're finished goods uh, on the balance sheet. And we can also help it help us determine, you know, when appropriate, uh, when do we take that cost of goods sold on the income statement. So as I have here, right, let's look at a uh, third example. It says, for example, assume we started six jobs this month, okay? And at the end of the month, jobs A and B were incomplete, C was finished, but it wasn't sold, and then D, E, and F were finished and sold. Okay? So we have jobs A through F. Some of them weren't complete, some of them were like halfway done, and some of them were done, and then we had sold them. Okay? Now we would use this information to determine which jobs uh, comprise our WIP and finished goods. So th that would be A and B, right? Uh, A and B are incomplete, right? So they're going to be, uh, in this case, right, part of our WIP, right, our work in process on our balance sheet. Uh, C here, this is finished but wasn't sold, so that's going to be part of our finished goods on our balance sheet, right? And then D, E, and F, right, uh, those are going to be part of our cost of goods sold because, hey, we finished it and we sold it, right? Remember we said when we sell it, we take that expense as cost of goods sold. So the idea with this is these job cost sheets uh, for each job, right, we're tracking those direct materials, our direct labor, our manufacturing overhead. What we've just seen, right, what we've been practicing, this would be like this one A would be like the roller coaster thing. Imagine our company was doing like six other things during the month. Some of them we finished, some of them we're still working on. We can use, right, these job cost sheets right here, the tracking sheets, to help us uh, prepare our financial statements. It really helps with the balance sheet and the income statement. Because remember we said in absorption costing, uh, as you incur these costs, uh, we're going to have them be absorbed on the balance sheet as part of inventory. And when they're in inventory, we have to break it out between WIP and finished goods. There's also raw materials, right? Um, and then when we sell it, we'll hit the income statement with an expense as our cost of goods sold. 
So as I have here, right, this chapter focused on job order costing for manufacturers. However, job order costing can also be used for service organizations such as law accounting firms, movie studios, hospitals, and repair shops. So, for example, in public accounting, right? Public accounting is um, a type of accounting where you're serving the general public, right? Uh, it's kind of like a law firm in the sense that people come in, you can provide them accounting services. You can do their taxes, you can do their audits. But what happens is, right, in public accounting, each client is going to be a job, right, if we were like tracking our costs of our jobs here. And um, our direct materials, these might be the accounting forms we use, right? Our direct labor is going to be our staff's build time, right? And then our manufacturing overhead, uh, that'll be things like uh, you know, our secretaries, rent, depreciation. Uh, one thing I will say about public accounting is direct labor and staff's build time. You do bill your time uh, like in 15 minute intervals. So they really, if anybody's going to track the cost of a job correctly, right, it's going to be an accountant. So uh, do be aware of that if you're planning on majoring in accounting. But in any event, right, uh, we will look at a couple problems in the next video. So this will be it for the PowerPoint lecture. We will see you in the uh, second video.